the irony was some guys joined the Navy or Air Force or Coast Guard in order not to be in the Army or the Marines in Vietnam because <laughs> they were almost all des destined for either infantry or armor. Um, so m most of the guys who went in the Navy and got assigned to the Medical Corps <laughs> had no idea at the time that they might very well end up being the corpsmen with the Marines in the, tro in the tropics. <laughs> That's where I wanted to be. That's what I was thinking about doing when I left college to go in is I want to go do that. I didn't realize I would be able to fly and be with the Marines. So I told the chief petty officer and he and I were on good working relationships so it wasn't insubordinate but I said just give me a green uniform get the hell out of the way. And I went that's what I literally told him. So I went back to California to Camp Pendleton which is just north of San Diego where I'd gone to boot camp and original hospital core school. So then you went to Fleet Marine School, and the Marines then take hospital corpsmen and put them through four months of pretty intense training so they can A, keep up with the Marines, B, know what to do when Marines are wounded or sick, a lot of treatment of combat injuries kinds of training, pretty intense. And then of course, major physical fitness work because the average Navy corpsman was nowhere near as fit as the average Marine coming out of Marine Corps basic training. Those people are really tough and strong and, and they absolutely, to a person, live up to their reputation. And it's not only about physical strength and the ability to run toward the fire, which is what we called it, but it's also about honor. There's just a real focus on how you carry yourself both on and off base, both in and out of uniform. And I really liked that stuff because, you know, I was a Boy Scout and my dad was a man of tremendous honor and character. So I went through four months of, of Marine Corps, uh, Fleet Marine School. And, uh, you know, you're up at 5 a.m. and you have about a half an hour of, uh, of, of intensive calisthenics. Then you run about a mile in combat boots to the mess hall and have breakfast and you run back. And then you start whatever you're going to do for the day and at night you have calisthenics again. And so, you know, how to break down an M16 and clean it and put it back together, which came in handy because I carried one. Uh, how to break down a 45 semi-automatic pistol, which I also carried and reassemble it after you've cleaned it. Um, not much hand-to-hand -hand combat training, only one day of that. That was, that was scary that, you know, I'm, I've never been a brawler. And so I, I always assume I'm gonna be the one on the bottom of the pile. But they, they taught me pretty well, how, and so self-defense came natural. And the, the gunnery sergeant, uh, staff sergeant, excuse me, who was in charge of our training group, again, about 30 corpsmen, said, you know, he says, if you get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, Doc, we've been overrun and the game's over anyway. He says, you're not going to, you're going to be surrounded by Marines. If you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we're all an expletive deleted, you know, <laughs> okay. So I didn't worry about that very much. You know, time on the rifle range, learning to shoot straight. I grew up, part of where I, where I grew up in Colorado was, was on a cattle ranch. And, uh, you know, my grandpa and my dad were used to hunting venison. And, um, and, and that's what we ate is we ate more venison than we did beef growing up. So I knew how to shoot already. I knew how to fish. I knew how to build a shelter. I knew how to build a fire. So a whole lot of that stuff, including the land and sea survival. I didn't like the sea survival part of the aviation training, you know, they, they, one, I'll just tell you one thing. They strap you into a parachute harness because if you eject over water and you've got a high wind, the parachute will come down sideways and drag you through the water till you drown. You have to be able to get out of it while it's moving. So they put you in a parachute harness, put you up on the back of a landing craft like the Marines go ashore in. It's got a big tower on it as high as that ceiling and you're in your parachute harness and it's on rollers like a little railroad track. And when, at a signal, they fire up the LST and take off, and you roll off the back of the thing, and you hit the water, and they tow you through the water at about 12 knots or so until you can get out of your parachute harness. If you don't panic, it's easy. You just roll over on your back, and the motion causes the water to be hitting you about here. Then you just have to get the things undone in the right order and just roll out. I didn't like that part very much because I'm not a big open water person, but I did great at the land survival stuff because we lived off the land at Eglund Air Force Base, in, which is e east of Pensacola down on the Panhandle, huge place like Camp Pendleton is. We lived off the land there in a Ponderosa forest, 
for about five or six days with somebody to teach us a lot of what I already knew, but nonetheless, and that included orienteering with a map and compass, how to find your way without roads or trails. And I did, I did great at all of that. And then you had a three day period where you had to get from one point to another point, and it was five miles by five miles, and you had to get across or around or without being captured, and there were Air Force personnel looking for us, you know, being trained. So I did it real well at all, at all that. So when I was at Camp Pendleton, I was already in better shape than most of the other corpsmen. I had already been through rougher stuff than some of it. But there were, you know, obstacle courses and ropes to swing over the mud holes and walls to climb and, and got a call through a, a culvert that's kind of muddy and half full of water. And under machine gun, under, under barbed wire with machine gun bullets, live machine gun bullets overhead. I mean, so it, very intensive Marine Corps training, but also the medical training of what do you do with a wounded Marine. And after I got done with that, um, there was a little airfield right at Camp Pendleton. They had, you know, about six or eight Hueys, a single rotor on top, the Hueys. And um, they needed an, an aviation medicine tech. So right out of Fleet Marines Corps, I, and again, I had made friends in town and I had a little apartment off campus as soon as I got done with my training. And I, and I stayed at this, air, at this little airfield for about eight months. And again, primarily in charge with the flight surgeon of doing the flight physicals for the pilots and air crew we had there. And that's where I first was flying around in Hueys as an, as an air crew member. Uh, on training missions for the pilots mostly. And I arrived at a place uh, in, in November uh, of 1970, and I had gone in in November of 67. And typically a tour of duty in Vietnam was 13 months long. Um, so I thought I don't have 13 months left, so the likelihood of my being sent over there for less than a year is about next to zero because they weren't, and plus there was some talk of starting to draw down already even in 71 there was some question about, you know, Nixon's Vietnamization of the war, turn it over to the to the South Vietnamese soldiers. So I thought, you know, it's not likely that I'm gonna go. I was willing to go, I was trained, you know, but I was getting to fly and I was a happy camper. Well, when there are only 90 of your military occupational specialty, MOS, when there's only 90 of you in the whole Navy and Marine Corps, and a couple of guys get injured or killed in Vietnam flying, they, 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 that's different. And so I got the, the chief petty officer, a different guy, came in and said, Doc, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, you got orders to Vietnam. And I said, really? When? And he said, yesterday, he said, it's expedited. That means you got three days to be on a plane for Vietnam. So I literally that day turned my files over to the other corpsman, got off early, went to my bank, closed my bank account, went to my apartment, shut it down. It was a furnished apartment, so I just had to gather up a few things. A little studio, so I just had a place off base. And uh, drove over to Phoenix, where or Glendale, Arizona, where my parents lived, left my car and my guitar and my best wishes and got on a plane in Phoenix and went to Norton Air Force Base. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm, and I was on a civilian airline, that's what's nuts. You fly to Hawaii, change planes, and then fly right into Da Nang, which is up, Da Nang is, is up in i -Corps, which is where the Marines were. Are you familiar with those, that i -Corps term? Okay. And the Army had two corps and three corps down near the Delta. So I was at the, so I got orders to the Marble, it's called Marble Mountain Air Facilities, but it was Marine Air Group 16, MAG 16. It was all Marine helicopters. A big helicopter base, literally right on the shores. I mean, most of the base was sand, the shores of the, of the South China Sea. Uh, the, the, the evacuation hospital, Army hospital that was just up the road from us, where we often dropped off patients, that was the model for the TV program, China Beach. So that's where we were, is right, what's called China Beach, that area. And um, I flew into <laughs> I flew into the Air Force Base there. It was across the river and across Da Nang from where we were. But we're literally across the river from, and the main highway from Da Nang. Guys, three Marines picked me up in a Jeep with a machine gun on the back, and <laughs> I climbed in. And the, Scotty, the sergeant, with the driver, handed me his M16 and said, welcome to the NOM, doc. Do you know how to use this? And I said, I do. He said, okay, let's go. 
And they had one Marine in the back scouting around looking and the other guy standing behind the machine gun. And it's because, as I later found out, that we, Da Nang was off limits for us. We couldn't go in there for anything without being armed. And then only because we were doing something, we were on a mission of some kind. Because there were snipers everywhere, you know, waiting for troops to come into Da Nang. <laughs> and this is the second largest city in all of Vietnam. And, and of course, it was guerrilla warfare. You'd expect snipers, of course. But it's not what the American people tended to think. They were still stuck on what conventional warfare looks like. You know, they didn't get guerrilla warfare, you know. Uh, a war where there was no Geneva Conventions. I mean, there were no rules, which showed up a lot in what happened. You know, on, sometimes on our side, but a lot on theirs. So that's what happened. As I went to Vietnam, I got there in early December of 1971. Um, I was already in E5. I outranked most of the corpsmen who were already there. There were only two of us aviation med techs. The other guy didn't want to fly, and flying was, even if you had my MOS, flying was voluntary. Nobody in the, in the medical group was ordered to fly medevacs. And the reason for that is it was just really, really hazardous. <laughs> and, they only, so, and, and, you know, there were, I think, at the time I was there, I think there were 12 of us. Uh, and we rotated. We had a 12-hour either day, daytime shift, and, you know, sometimes you go and get on a helicopter and you're, except for refueling, you know, you're, you're, you're going all day. Um, and then we'd have a couple of days free, and then we rotate into a 12-hour night shift, and we'd be over on the flight line sleeping in a Quonset hut there, ready to go, I mean, fully dressed, ready to go. Sometimes we'd have a night when we didn't have any missions at all. Uh, night medevacs are called only when there are emergencies, meaning the guy will not make it till morning and we would always go out. And sometimes you'd have none, sometimes you could be lifted off and if there was a lot going on, you could be flying all night long, you know. But then of course they'd let you get some sleep the next day and all that. So there were 12 of us all volunteered. We caught, I didn't come up with this, they called themselves the Wild Bunch. The, or they also had, they nicknamed the MAG-16 Flying Docks. Kind of this elite group that was, they were all really, really good at what they did, by the way. They were really skilled, and they were about half nuts. So, <laughs> but nobody, well, I immediately volunteered, and we tried to discourage anybody with children. There were some guys who were married and had kids, and, you know, we thought, yeah, this, <laughs> and uh, some married guys chose to fly, but most of the guys, I mean, they were young guys. They weren't married yet, you know. I, I was older than most of them, and I was, I turned 23 in the spring of, of 71, and I, and I was considered one of the older, more, I mean, most of them by the time they finished their tour in Vietnam, they were E-4s, would be like a corporal. Um, but I went there at E-5, and I had been in the Navy longer than anybody except the career non-commissioned officers, the chief petty officer, and we had one E-6 who did supplies. Anyway, so that's what I did is I flew medevacs from Da Nang Marble Mountain area all the way up to the DMZ and from the South China Sea over to the border of Laos, uh, which we were not allowed to go into for combat reasons, except uh, when, ta when uh, what was it called? Uh, it was called Tan San something or other. Oh, Le no, Lam San, uh, Lam San Nut, I think, but it was a Vietnamese term, but it's when the Arvin soldiers went in, because we were not allowed to by our Congress, they went in, they went into Laos to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And we put their infantry in there, the helicopters went in to Laos to put there in there and picked up wounded when they had them and brought them out. But our infantry troops were technically were not there. Now I, I know for a fact that there were some long range patrols that weren't measuring where the border is sometimes when they, when they went in. But by and large units did, of infantry did not go in and try to cut, so it was, that whole thing was just a disaster. But that's what I did. And, I, and, and then when I, wasn't, when I wasn't flying, if I didn't have a flight shift, then I was busy taking care of the flight physicals, me and one other guy. For all the pilots and gunners, we had, we had machine guns on all our helicopters, and we had 250 calibers on ours, and we had a, a, an NCO on our helicopters with each 50 cal. Then there was a crew chief and me, each with an M16, so we had we had four lines of fire coming out of helicopters, and 
I flew in what's called CH-46s. They, they had twin rotors on top. The Army has big ones, CH-47 Chinook. These are about two-thirds that size, but they're the same principle, twin rotors on top. And they're a little smaller, uh, a little bit more maneuverable because they're smaller than, than a big Chinook is. And they're called a CH-46 C Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, we called them frogs, P-H-R-O-G, because sitting on a runway, they looked, they slightly sloped up and they had a stubby wing tank on the back where the rear wheels were. And so it looked for all the world like a frog getting ready to jump. So that's what we called them as frogs, but P-H-R-O-G-S. And we would always have two gunships with us. Um, when we went out in to do medevacs, there were, we were always protected by and reinforced by these Huey gunships or Cobras, which were like a little Ferrari with everything you can imagine on it. A two-pilot thing, but they had, they had, the newer ones had two turbine engines on them. You could blow one out altogether and still do everything with the other. So they would be out here and they would be a lead bird, which I most often was on by choice, and then they had a chase bird. So if we couldn't get all the patients, these guys would go in and get the rest. Or if we got shot down, they would come in and get us. So, so if a medevac flight for us was four helicopters, pretty well armed. Very distinct from how the Army dust stuff did it. They took one Huey, and at first they had a big red cross on the nose of them, but there was no Geneva Convention, so what's, what's the point? But they would go in with one helicopter, and they would be in and out real fast. They couldn't carry as many people, and they couldn't return much fire. But they often had their own support aircraft around them. But dust off, we thought they were nuts because they were in and out and, you know, not much able to shoot back and couldn't take as many patients, but they were in and out quick. When we go in, if we drew fire, we were ready for a fight. And the Marine Corps model was, if they shoot at you, shoot back, you know? <laughs> so it was, a, it was a major operation when we did that. So that's what I did in Vietnam was uh, go in, not, not just wounded Marines, um, but civilians, a lot of times civilians get caught in a crossfire, including children. Uh, our, in the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese soldiers, we did all the medical evac for them. We had uh, a detachment of Korean Marines on our air base. They had their own little place on, down near the flight line. And they had one little Piper Cub, looks like a Piper Cub spotter plane. But we did all of their troop inserts and extractions as well and medical evacuations when needed. Uh, and those guys, those Korean Marines were probably the scariest people in the whole war because they had all been studying martial arts and you know, some kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff. And uh, they didn't, they, they were, their corpsman came over with a translator because they needed supplies and we went through everything, gave them everything you could possibly want except we were not allowed to distribute morphine. They had, to, they had to get their own, and they had to get it from the doctor, which, which they did. But every battle dressings and tourniquets and all the stuff they needed. So we kept him supplied. He was a very friendly, quiet guy. But uh, he, they had their own medical person, and he just got supplies from us when he got short. I didn't have much interaction with them, but you could put eight or ten of them on your helicopter. And they just sat silently until you got to the, They didn't chat. They weren't nervous. They, you know, these guys are fierce, <laughs> but the Marines could hold their own, no, no doubt in my mind. I, I never felt like I was at a disadvantage being in a war with Marines. You know, I, I believe the safest place to be in a war zone is surrounded by <laughs> Marines, even if you're the corpsman. So, yeah. So I don't know what else you want to ask me. Do uh, any of those, uh, those uh, medical evacuations stand out in your mind for whatever oh, reason? Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I'll try to tell you about a few. One of the worst was we, we were up somewhere, and again, I never knew where we were, unless the pilot said, we're going to Hue or we're going to Quezon, or, you know. But I never knew, I just knew we were somewhere between the South China Sea and Laos and the DMZ and, and Marble Mountain area. But, you know, it was, it was beautiful, by the way, flying over, over Vietnam. There were a lot of bomb craters and, and some burnout villages, and that's not pretty. But generally speaking, you know, this tropical rainforest and all the rice patches and things, it's just stunningly beautiful, beautiful. And we were past um, the monsoon season, uh, the rainy season, where it just pours for six months, ends about in late December, early January. So we were past that. 
there would still be rain clouds. It would still cloud up and rain in the afternoon, but it'd be like thunder showers and then gone. Um, so we were up there somewhere up to up north of, of Marble Mountain Air Base. And we, we and I didn't know how many patients or what we were going to receive. We just got, you know, we, 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 were get, we were already in the air doing something, I forget. And they called for an emergency and we were in the neighborhood. So we, we took our medevac flight and went right down in there. And um, the standard operating procedure was that when, when you're going into a hot LZ, that means where there's live fire going on and high risk of being shot at, okay? Um, it's called a strike mission. It, it's, it's counted differently than just, you know, what we call the milk run where you're delivering somebody from here to there. Uh, we went down and, and it was, there was a firefight that erupted between a Marine platoon and a village that was a suspected Viet Cong village. This is what I learned afterwards. And, and when you're going down into the zone, um, y your primary job is to be ready to suppress fire. So you have a machine gun over here and then me sitting over here, and then a crew chief sitting over there and a machine gun there. So either side of the helicopter, you can get fired. And of course, the crew chief and I could cover the back if we needed to. And when we landed, one of us was usually down near the ramp in the back. This is a bird that lowers a ramp and people run on. So typically we would get there, they would, the Marines would bring their wounded on. Sometimes I could see out of the corner of my eye what we got and what we don't. But mostly I was locked and loaded and staring out the window because you know, if you saw green tracers coming at you, you knew where to aim. And suppressing fire was, was important. So then I would, as soon as we lifted off and you know, took off, I'd put safety on MAM-16, put it down, turn around and start taking care of Marines, whatever we got. I turned around and there were no Marines, but there were two kids little kids about uh, about six to eight years of age and they both had multiple shrapnel wounds and the little girl was missing her left arm from here down and they had some had a battle dressing on her arm and a tourniquet and I know the corpsman had done as much as he could quickly, but they, we went in pretty quick, and I think he might have been tending to Marines. And so I put these two little kids on. Well, they were both bleeding badly. They're little kids. They got caught in the crossfire somehow. And I had to make a choice about which one to help first. Uh, if I did the same for both of them right away, the high probability was they would both, you can bleed to death in three minutes if you got arterial bleeding. So I had to choose which one to help first, and she was more badly hurt because of her arm, and I didn't know for sure if I could get to both of them. But if I tried to get to both of them in their condition, this is just something you know from months already of taking care of wounded Marines you might not be able to save either of them. This is called triage. You have to sort out what to do very quickly. So I reinforced her tourniquet, got battle dressings on her worst wounds, I turned to her, help the little boy, and he was already going into shock. You know, he was cyanotic and blue lips and fingertips and all of that. And I did the best I could with him while monitoring her. And when we got to the 95th to back to drop him off, she was alive and he wasn't. And no matter how many wounded Marines, uh, that one was hard. And I've never forgotten the face of that little boy, you know? And in truth, I had nightmares. I had PTSD symptoms for decades before they finally figured out how to treat it. And um, Sometimes I used to have a dream in which I'd be there with those two kids. Only in the nightmare, as he died, I looked at his face and it was my face as a little boy. So what I believe is that something in me died when he did. You know, it's hard to say. I have to say here that I'm not a person who's uncomfortable with my own tears. I'm a professional psychotherapist. My training is in psychology and I'm a professor emeritus a graduate professor from a university where I trained mental health care therapists for 20 years. So I don't see uh, sorrow as weakness. Um, I see weakness as weakness, but not sorrow. 
So that was a hard one. Um, there was another one where there was a, this was north of Way, and it was sometime again in the late spring uh, of 71. Uh, you know, May, maybe early June, I don't know. But, you know, the, the when things happen are all a blur. But what happened is, isn't much. Uh, the, there was, a, there was a, 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 a Marine unit out on search and destroy patrol, and they ran into an NBA unit somewhere north of way but s south of the DMZ. And I mean, a pitch battle began, and the NBA start bringing more, and we start bringing more. Pretty soon, there's a major ruckus going on, you know. With you know, I mean, aircraft coming in and working out, and all kind of that stuff. So, we uh, and, and I was again in the lead bird, and we went down into a, a pretty active LZ, <laughs> and you know, an occasional round in the helicopter. You can hear it when they hit. It sounds like a thunk. It doesn't go bang. It sounds like thunk. Um, and again, I turned when we lifted off. I turned and uh, you know put down my M16 by the window and and turned, and there were seven wounded Marines in the helicopter, and one corpsman. And where we were was far enough north it was going to take us. We averaged about 20 to 25 minutes from the time we picked up a wounded Marine till we had him either at a, an, an army uh, field unit hospital or the USS Sanctuary, which was a hospital ship right off the coast, about three miles, uh, down near Da Nang. And depending upon how close we were, that's where we would, would take them. But we were far enough north it was going to take us a few more minutes, five or ten minutes longer to get to where we were going. So that having been said, not, not one of them had anything of significance done to help them. They were all wounded bullet wounds and shrapnel, you know, a pitch firefight with hand grenades and mortars and all that stuff. So um, their corpsman apparently on the ground had either been killed or wounded because these guys wouldn't have had no, no, no battle dressings or anything, you know, by the time it took us to get there, a few minutes. To get me. So by the time we got to the, 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 the Army Field Surgical Hospital, which was a little closer than the hospital ship. I did real quick triage, and by God's grace, they all were breathing. They had intact airways. Because trying to fix a guy whose face is all battered up or who's got a neck wound, you have to do a little minor surgery to just create a way for him to get air into his lungs, which is hard to do in a bouncy helicopter, but you're, you're trained to do it. Uh, they were all breathing. So I had to do a quick assessment about who's bleeding the worst. And I had one guy with a partially amputated arm. I think a, an explosive round of some kind had lit, went off next to him. And another guy had a bad shoulder wound uh, that I think had hit a brachial artery. Because that's a major artery runs down this way. So, you know, he's spurting blood and trying to push it back. And so I did those two first. And, and, and a couple of guys had smaller shrapnel wounds. And uh, you have to lift them all if they're laying down. You got to lift them up and look behind them because if you miss an exit wound, you can fix everything on the front and they'll bleed to death out the back without you knowing it. So everybody, you get a look at their exit wounds. You know, on a leg, if it goes through the thigh and you got an exit wound, it's probably going to be okay. You can just crank it right down. So what's, what am I saying? This was a significant one to me. I'll never forget it because I had them all bandaged. And all of them, but one, had received morphine um, for the pain, so they weren't going into shock. And that one had a, what we call a sucking chest wound. You, you get a piece of shrapnel or a bullet goes in here, and it creates a hole, and when you breathe, it sucks air in between your lungs and your rib cage. And pretty soon that lung collapses and you can suffocate. So you have to stop that from happening. And you do it with saran wrap. <laughs> You write over the thing and then tape it down and then you put a battle dressing over it and you tie the knot right over the wound. Then you put him on his injured side, which seems counterproductive, but if he's laying on the wounded side, his other lung can go unimpaired and breathe and keep him alive. But you never give morphine, never give morphine to a chest wound, a sucking chest wound because it suppresses respiration. You don't want to limit their breathing. All seven of those guys were alive 
and and got to be really fast. <laughs> and I I saved them all. I, and, and, and when I was done, I got to clean up my Marine Corps language here. We had dropped them all off, and and. Uh, they frequently, knowing we're coming, they'll run out with coffee for us and all that stuff. So I was walking down the end of the ramp with the crew chief and one of the gunners, and crew chief's got seven M16s, <laughs> like cordwood. I mean, he's carrying, we don't want all those automatic weapons on the bird, so carries them down and gives them. There's always Marines uh, there, you know, to, or Army soldiers, and you just hand them to them and they take care of them. They'll unload them and all that. This gunner, a staff sergeant, probably, well, he's a career Marine, probably on his second or third tour in Vietnam already. And he came up to me, and it, uh, probably the best, highest compliment, or one of the highest compliments I've ever received. He put his hand on my shoulder, just like I'm facing you. He put his hand on my shoulder and looked me from about that far, looked me square in the eyes. And he said, you can put in the Marine Corps expletives here, but I, he said, Expletive deleted, Doc. You are one snake-eyed, cold, efficient, expletive deleted. And walked away. And I went, okay. <laughs> and what I didn't realize is that I had become that. And I was just a night. I did lots of training, and I was 22 when I went to Vietnam. So I was older than most of the other corpsmen, and I was had more advanced training than most of the other corpsmen because of aviation school. But... Um, it didn't dawn on me that that shy, naive, brainy kid would become a person that was that focused and that skilled and that, um, I don't know what adjective to put to it, but um, I, I was, I had really, I, I don't know how else to put it, I had really changed. Now this was, I was only there about six months because my whole unit got pulled out in the summer of 71 and they sent me home two weeks early to do some prep for returning units. So, but I'd been there several months and I had not paid attention to how much I was changing. But that was the day I realized, holy cow, that's not me. And that's where I was wrong. It absolutely was me. Who I was is who I wasn't anymore. So that's a memorable mission because seven wounded Marines and in 30 minutes had it all under control. I mean, that means about three or four minutes per guy on average. Some took longer than others. I remember that one. That, for that particular mission, I got what's called a single mission air medal. Air medals are one notch below a uh, uh, bronze star. And you get tw when you fly 20 strike missions, 20 missions under fire, that automatically leads to an air medal for valor. But on particular missions, you can you can get an air medal for just what you did on one particular mission, just like you would any other, you know, Bronze Star, Silver Star, whatever. And um, that particular mission, I got a single mission air medal. And that day, I remember, because it was the busiest day of my entire time there. We went back to that same spot eight times in one day. So there, there. It's not, it's not on, it's not unheard of to get eight strike missions in a day, but it's very unusual. We were busy enough that halfway through the day, the pilots switched and they brought on two new pilots. The gunners and the crew chief and I stayed, but it was much more stressful for the pilots. They got to fly and they're in and out of, play. You know, one of the times we went back there, I remember this one because it was really, really busy, and we touched down in an LZ. They had two or three LZs because there were so many troops down there. And we were across a big field, meadow, rice paddy thing, and then there was just a ridge of tropical rainforest, you know, where they were hiding. They, they were up there. We were down on the, we, the Marines were down more on the level. And we could see mortars as we tried to pick up Marines. We could see mortar fire coming from about a mile away, and there's a process they call walking the mortars toward the target. You know, they estimate the range, they fire, and from there, they know they got to go forward or back, right or left. You know, they do their, and it takes about two or three rounds for them to get you zeroed in. Well, they were they were clearly walking mortars right towards the helicopter. <laughs> 
And we were just getting the Marines on, so it was a matter of seconds before one of the other, okay? And in comes a couple of F-4 Phantoms. They're fixed-wing bombers that were stationed uh, at the Air Force Base across the Diné. In come, <laughs> and I didn't see or hear them, because they were, they were treetop and coming in low. And they came in and both of them dropped two pots of napalm each. And the hill just became, <laughs> the whole hill became a fireball and the mortar stopped and we got out of there. But I'll never forget that. All the helicopters, all the gunships are just over the heads of the Marines that are in the grass and they're pouring everything they got into the, and you can even hear, and our machine guns are, you know, you can hear them above the turbines and the blades. <laughs> Both of them going off at once. <laughs> and here come the mortars, and I'm just thinking, oh. <laughs> and then and the fixed, somebody called the fixed wing, and, and they just turned the whole, didn't have to aim, just <laughs> drop them. <laughs> just drop them there. Anyway, and we got out of there. So it was a really, really hairy day. And that one flight was the most I ever had on my helicopter. It was seven at one time. And again, so, something had happened to their corpsman because they, Normally they'd be all bandaged up and they'd be, half of them would have morphine already and you know, but they came on and it's like I had, I had just been standing next to them and they got hit, you know, and put them on and some of them laying down and some of them sitting up, there were benches along the side of the helicopter canvas bench. And that was a busy one, those two. Um, one, one more and, and th th this was when we went out and, and this one is the one that surprised me too. It wasn't so much the mission, but after the mission that I was, oh, look at that. Um, we went out to the USS Sanctuary. We had two hospital ships, the USS Sanctuary and the USS Repose. I think there was a third, but I forget. I hadn't never around it. Well, and the, those two would rotate at six months intervals back to the States. And they just anchor or, or float out there. And they had, after the Gulf of Tonkin, they had, uh, Patrol boats and a, and a destroyer out there around them to protect the hospital ship. And we dropped off Marines. And again, uh, I had run out, I mean, it was a very busy day. Not that same day I told you about, but uh, I had, I had uh, a few wounded Marines. We took them out to the hospital ship. We had time to get out there. But I was running low on supplies because I'd had two or three missions already. And, and, you know, you have a satchel like this, you know, but, and you can start to run out of battle dressings pretty quickly. So I told the pilot, and the pilot patched me through to the hospital ship as we were going in. And so I could tell him what I needed. So here's the scene. The crew chief's coming down out of the helicopter with the M16s and the wounded guys. I'm walking down out of the helicopter, down the ramp, Okay, looking for a cup of coffee, frankly. <laughs> and I'm and I'm wiping the blood off my hand. I got a blood stain, you know, flight suit. I'm wiping the blood off my hands with a four by four. It's not my blood. Wiping it off just like you'd, you know, blow your nose with a Kleenex or something. And um, I got on a flight helmet, a bullet bouncer with a K bar, that's a combat knife strapped to it. Always carried that upside down like everybody else. Um, I had a 45 caliber pistol underneath my left shoulder, and I just set an M16 down and was wiping, you know, all that stuff. So out comes two Navy corpsmen in white uniforms, okay, and they were both E3s, which means they had just gotten out of hospital core school. These guys were, were uh, newbies, I'm cleaning up my Marine Corps language, these were new, new and they were kids, you know. Uh, when I went in the Navy, I was just a kid myself. I was 19, but I was still older than most of them who went in. So they came out, and each of them had a canvas bag about three feet tall, just stuffed with everything you can imagine, you know, battle dressings and tourniquets and field surgical kits and gauze four-by-fours and everything you'd need. And they each come out carrying one of these bags to the ramp, and I'm coming down the ramp, and they both set down their bags, snapped to attention, and saluted me. And their eyes are big, kind of like a holy, <laughs> look at this guy. <laughs> 
And, you know, anybody who knows me knows I've always been rather slender and I've never been much of a physical threat. I'm very capable of doing what I need to in the woods. I can survive. I'm a backpacker. I'm all that. But I've never been a person who likes either competitive sports, especially contact sports, mostly because everybody else playing was bigger than I was, you know. When I got to Vietnam, I was 5'10 and weighed 140 pounds. And that's after putting on 12 pounds of muscle with the Marines, you know, in four months. So I weighed 125 when I went in the Navy and I was 18, 19 years old. Really a beanpole kid. Anyway, these two, these two young corpsmen, and then I, you know, I just waved a suit off and told them to follow me. They went up into the bird with me, which I'm, I don't know if they'd ever been inside a helicopter or not, but the, the, everything's still going. It's screaming, you know, the turbines are loud. And, and uh, I fortunately, I've got my helmet on, but they're just in the screaming noise, bless their hearts. So we stashed all the gear underneath the underneath the benches so it wouldn't get blown away we took off and uh they kind of stepped around me and uh, i don't know how else to put it they were like deferential i don't think they were scared i think they were uh it sounds like bragging but i don't mean it but it's like they were a little awestruck it's like it's like i might have been john wayne from the sands of Iwo Jima or clint eastwood or something you know but because they 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 had they they knew what the war was with all the patients that were being dropped off. They knew there was some nasty stuff going on, but they were shielded from any danger because they were on a hospital ship protected by the Navy. So when they saw me, you know, they saw somebody outrank them, somebody who was older than they was, somebody who had different training and a different job. But what they really saw was a blood-stained flight suit, which I was pretty used to. You know you. Can't keep it sterile and clean. And I was the thing is, I was wiping the blood off my hands with a piece of gauze, and their eyes got so big. And what dawned on me that day was that they were seeing in me something I was not seeing in my own mirror. The term I use for it is I had become the war. I was at home. I was not relaxed, but comfortable, meaning I knew what was going on. I was very experienced, I was well trained, I loved to fly, I was surrounded by Marines that I trusted even though I didn't know. Every time I went up, I had a different crew. You just get on whatever helicopter has medevacs of the day. But the pilots and the gunners and the crew chief, all they knew was, here's Doc, we can go. But I didn't know them, I didn't know their names, I didn't know, but the bonding, the camaraderie was still there. I mean, Marines, how do I put that, the Marines? take very good care of their dog. And part of that is he's a sailor who might not know what's going on. <laughs> and part of that is in a firefight, he's the only guy who has to be up moving around. And if you know what you're doing and you don't choke, you're like this to them. So the, the camaraderie and the bonding was always there. I just didn't know them. I just knew the other docs who flew. And we all had call signs. We all, we, you don't wear your name on your uniform when you're when, when no Geneva Conventions. I mean, look what happened to John McCain. There's no Geneva Conventions. So you don't want your identity of who your family is back home, right? So everybody had a call sign, like Maverick from Top Gun, except we didn't have those. Because of how skinny I was, how slender, I mean, I had zero body fat. It was very fit, but just a beam pole, like I say. The guys are going to, and the other corpsmen, flight corpsmen, are the ones who give you your call. You don't tell them what you're going to be called. So there was Beaner, who in the days before political correctness, he was Latino. He didn't mind the name. Uh, there was Birdie. Uh, uh, his last name was, was um, well, his first name was Jay, so we call him Jay Bird, and then later just Birdie. And there was Tex, who was from Texas, and always wore a cowboy hat. There was Pookie, who was rounder than most of the corpsmen but also had more experience. He was one of the lead guys. He really knew what he was doing. And uh, he was called that because of the name of a teddy bear that his niece had, Pookie. It kind of fit him, you know. Uh, and, and Stretch, who was Italian-American, and he was over six feet tall, and we played mumbly peg in, to lull away the time in the back behind the dispensary, and nobody could beat him because he could reach halfway across Vietnam. He was so tall, so he was called Stretch. And they were going to call me Twiggy. There was a six, there was a, in the 60s, there was a boyish looking 
uh, uh, pre-developed, shall we say, short-haired little pixie of a model named Twiggy in, in Britain. And she was in all the rage, you know, like the Kardashians are now, okay. But very, very skinny. And they were going to call me Twiggy, and I outranked most of them, and I said, not a snowball's chance. <laughs> so they agreed to take the feminine ending off, and they called me Twig. That was my call sign. But having grown up around the woods and around nature, that fit me just fine, a little piece of the forest. And that's what I was called, was Twig. So anyway, that that's who the guys were that were flying. And um, I forget where I was going with this. Um, but anyway, I, I, I saw myself in the eyes of those two fledgling corpsmen, and th they saw somebody who was fighting the war, and I thought of myself as a person who was along to take care of the wounded, but not as a person who was thought by others to be a, not a, a warrior, but somebody who knew what they were doing when, as at peace with all of it. So I wasn't at peace with war. That's kind of really, that's, that's nonsensical. But I was adjusted, that's the best way to put it. I had changed enough so it was natural and normal, and I had stopped being as afraid. And it's not that you don't get afraid still, especially in really bad hazardous missions, but it kind of goes into the unconscious or it becomes less important than the mission, or you kind of just get what we psychologists call stimulus accommodation, meaning you kind of get used to it. Like, you know, you first step outside on a hot day, it's like a blast furnace, and then you don't feel it as much. Same kind of a thing. Uh, any other missions that I'm trying to think of? No, I think that pretty much co covers what it was like. But I, let me tell you what kind of casualties we would get. We would get people, um, gunshot wounds, of course, and they could be anywhere. Um, most of those are pretty heavy uh, caliber weapons. The AK-47 has got a bigger bullet than the M16, but the M16 bullets were faster and they were side-loaded, so they, when they hit you, they would tumble and just really tear you up. Uh, and, and they didn't have much recoil because of the smaller caliber, but they were designed to actually do as much or more damage as any other round, except a 50 caliber, of course, and that basically cuts you in half. Um, but we had bullet wounds. Shrapnel from explosions, mortars, or uh, incoming artillery, there wasn't a lot of that, but, but mortars, a lot of booby trap stuff, leg amputations especially. The worst was, uh, the worst, the worst uh, there were two kinds that were really worst, booby traps, I mean, because it could be a trip wire, you, you know, you stumble, and it was all fishing line, you could hardly see it, and it's, trip that thing and the thing explodes, goes off. Um, there were um, b uh, bouncing beddies, they called them. They, they were smaller, but they had what small charge underneath. And when you triggered it, uh, it would bounce the, the, the big explosive up about waist height and then it would go off, which is where you got a lot of amputations of legs, you know, and a lot of really grisly abdomen wounds. Um, and the worst of all was, uh, or you could just turn something or someone over and there'll be a hand grenade attached. And, you know, so it was, it was, you know, pretty, my best description of the war, and it's not original with me, but a gunnery sergeant once told me, uh, this long after we got home, when somebody asked him what the war was like, he said it was a street fight in the jungle with automatic weapons. And I thought, that's about right. <laughs> you know? So, but the worst was what we call uh, a 105 round. A 105 round is, is, a, is a cannon, artillery shell. And we had them and they had them and, you know, uh, but, but they would bury a 105 round, an, an actual cannon shell in the ground, nose up, with a pressure switch on it. And when you stepped on it, it would go off, but it wouldn't throw out shrapnel and wound you and all that stuff. The guy who stepped on it, and I'm not exaggerating this, would essentially be disintegrated into little pieces. And one of my medevacs, a guy had done that up, up somewhere up north uh, of Da Nang, and, and uh, his, his comrades, and there were three other wounded Marines. I mean, the shell went off and it hit other, hit other Marines. So we had three wounded Marines and one KIA killed in action guy. And they had done the best they could to gather up what pieces, and I'm not exaggerating this, what pieces, mostly small pieces of him they could find, along with the grass and mud and leaves of the forest floor. And they had gathered him up and put him in his poncho. 
and brought the poncho onto the helicopter. Well, and I know they carried body bags, but they were busy and they didn't get this guy into a body bag. And the pilots were getting out of there because it's much safer at altitude than sitting on the ground in a helicopter out in the boonies. So we didn't get a chance to get his remain. Oh, the only thing recognizable was a boot with two leg bones sticking out of it. That's the only piece that would look like anything that was human. I mean, there was no head, no torso, no arms. No, I mean, he was just, you know, shredded. That's, but that's a really powerful, big explosive. It's a cannon shell. So he's in the back of the helicopter, back by the ramp. He came on last. I got three wounded Marines up front, and we take off before we get the the guy, the guy into a body bag and zipped it up. So I'm up there working on the three Marines who were wounded. Both the gunners and the crew chief sitting up front near some of the front windows. They put their visors down, got their heads over by the window. So as we were going, the wind blew by them and whatever was in the helicopter went out the back. I was the only one who had to be moving around and back and forth and I put my visor down too. But the back of the helicopter, have you ever seen one of those like phone booth things in a game show where you go inside and there's a wind blowing and there's dollars floating around and you have to gather up as much as you can? Okay, the inside of the helicopter was like that except it was pieces of that poor Marine blowing around, little pieces, mud and leaves and grass and viscera. And I'm the only one who had to be fairly near it so I could get to the third guy. And by the time we got them dropped off and the KIA, I had stuff all over my face and my chest and my legs and my hand, you know, and uh, I just nothing I could do about it because I had to be where I, where I was on that fringe of that most of me, and and I had, that's the only time a marine has ever hugged me. We got out, <laughs> we got down, we we got off the helicopter. The crew chief uh, took a power wash and was washing off the inside of the helicopter, just washing all the mud and the whatever was in it down off of there. And I stepped off the back of the helicopter and he turned down the pressure a little and which went just like this on me. And uh, we had radioed ahead and the guys over at the, we're, uh, the, the medical dispensary where we did all our other work was across the base in the flight line. They jumped in the Jeep and, and they got one of my flight flight my other flight suits and drove it over to me and you know I just stripped down right on the flight line and put on a clean flight suit and get and got back on a helicopter and we took off with this marine again it was a staff sergeant a different guy and they, these guys never say say much you know that you can tell when you're okay with them and when you're not <laughs> the guy came up and just like your grandfather would do just gave me a big bear hug and he Pulled me back and he looked right at me. He says, I know that was hard. And he and it was. And part of my memories, I don't know which is worse, the kids or that one, but that one, you know, is you can't you can't write that stuff, you know, but that was one of my worst days. That that took more focus and more courage and more don't choke than when we were under fire. Because you just had to deal with the grizzly and you couldn't keep it off of you, you know? So that's pretty grotesque, but those are some of the things that I remember. In World War II, they went over on a ship and they came back on a ship, right? And they had time to talk and play cards and, and you know, BS about it all and talk it out and get it and be with their guys and reminisce and do a lot of processing, which the brain needs to do in order to let it go. We didn't have any of that. I came home, I literally landed at a, at, a, at a base in California, got picked up by a relative who lived in California. My family didn't live there. They took me to an airport where I caught a flight to Phoenix. And I mean, I had no debriefing whatsoever before I got out of the military. And I had been in one of the most dangerous, most intensive, most psychologically traumatizing jobs you could have. I did well and I came home intact but it, I, I had ups and downs, but I had 40 years of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, they, they use that as an example. At the VA treatment hospital here, uh, and, the, and the clinical psychology treatment here for the VA is just superb. They finally have ways of treating post-traumatic stress disorder that we now know in my field, psychology, because of research in neuropsychology about what happens to the brain and if you can counter that 
with a treatment technique, and there are two different ones I use, and we don't need to go into what they are, but I went through that about, about uh, oh, eight years ago or so. Now I'm 75. I was in my 60s when I finally got treatment for PTSD. That's over 40 years of feeling the symptoms. Lost my first marriage due directly to the psychological impacts on my life, and you know, it, it does not train you to be a, a, a good out. I wasn't violent or, or any of that, but I was distant and, you know, nightmares and, and kind of obsessed with the war. Um, I went through that treatment, and then uh, it's made all the world of difference. I, there's no way on God's green earth I could have sat and talked to you about this stuff prior to going through that treatment with a psychologist at the, at the hospital. Great folks, <clears throat> great folks, and he did a good, it was four months long, very intense, and you had to remember the worst stuff and talk about it, and they would tape record it, and then you'd have to listen to it every day until the next session next week, and then you go back and tell the same stories, only the what I did not expect is the more you talk about it, the more the details emerge, and the feelings are attached, and so you have to go back in and deal with the feelings that you didn't have time with to deal with on the spot. And it helps your brain not to, it's not healed in that it's no longer affected by the war. It's healed, but in the same way that a broken bone will heal, it'll be stronger, but it won't ever be what it was, you know? Um, and, and again, I, I don't think I will ever approximate who I was before I went. Had I not been in the military or had I not been in combat, uh, I would probably just been a brainy, skinny university professor, intellectual all my life, who liked to go backpacking in the mountains alone, you know, because I'm, I'm a mountain kid. Uh, as it is, though, what I came back from, I, I never stopped being a sol I never stopped being a soldier. I, I still don't think of myself as a sailor, and never really have once I got in the room. I think of myself as a mar no, I don't think of myself as a marine because I didn't earn that. I didn't go through their basic training. But I think of myself as a fleet marine corpsman, and uh, that's close enough, you know. Uh, I went. I've, I've seen the wall in D.C. five times. First time was worst, as you can imagine. Uh, but the last time I went, I kind of got it, and that was maybe the last time I went was about ten years ago. It was at a reunion. My helicopter group uh, uh, is, was called Papa Smoke. It's the United States Marine Corps Helicopter Association. Everybody who's flown, air crew, pilots, gunners, everybody, corpsmen, they have this, you know, associate, almost like you have a fraternity that everybody, you know, and we have reunions every other year. And we had one in D.C. And that's when I went to the, to the, to the wall the fifth time. And standing there that time, I realized, and I'd made enough progress at coming home and healing, that I realized there's a whole, you know, there's guys on the wall who uh, were killed, and, and I brought their bodies out, we brought their bodies out, and I have no idea who they are. But they're up here somewhere, and I can get the dates of when I was there, say, well, there's somewhere between this wall and uh, this panel and that panel. And it dawned on me there's a bunch of names There, there's a bunch of names not on the wall because we were there. 